Jeannie uh, out, off on the, it's kind of like Mac Pedro. I don't know if some of the older generation might know what Mac Pedro is. Yeah. Uh, very happy to announce uh, Tim Parsons, CEO of Delta V. He's been a friend of mine for, for a number of years now and he's become uh, one of the driving forces behind the startup community in Australia. So uh, you got about 15 minutes, I'll give you a little bell at 10 minutes to know to start wrapping it up. Take it away. Thanks, Jason. Speak for yourself, mate. I, um, I'm pretty excited to uh, be here, and I'm also sad that I'm not there um, because I, um, I'm here in Adelaide right now working with the event community here to create some opportunity for us, but uh, really so excited uh, about the launch that happened yesterday morning and the atmosphere there must be amazing, so I wish I could be part of that. So my, my thoughts to you, you're full of the, the thought of those spacecraft heading up the ISS right now is pretty much all I can think about. So uh, anyway, thank you for having me today. I'm, uh, I'm going to go through a really quick uh, position statement, I guess I could call it, about entrepreneurship in Australia and the new space community. So I'm going to throw up a presentation. Hopefully you can see this okay. Uh, I, have, uh, I have a tendency to start these things and I think to do the slide, but so uh, do stop me. Um, one of my colleagues in Delta V, Aldous Vignel, uh, and I are working on a benchmarking project around startup because you know, so we're just trying to really look at what's happening globally and what lessons we can learn locally. Um, I'm going to take you through the rationale behind the original, original founding of Delta V. For those of you who've seen this before, apologies, I'm hoping there's a bunch of folks there who haven't. And then I'm also going to rip, quickly rip forward to what might we be looking 2030. So um, entrepreneurship is the focus of Delta B. So that doesn't just mean commercial things, that does mean joining up a whole ecosystem that might start with research folks and might end with companies, might end with special projects, might end with something that's an impact project, which is a not for profit. We don't care. But entrepreneurship is really the, the core foundation. Back in January 2014, these four folks got together. Um, the top two, Jason's own company, Saber, and another company that was founded by uh, a couple of uh, other luminaries, uh, Brian Lim and Slavia Tatanadini, that were pretty much the only startups that were around at that stage, so sort of stick, stick, sticking their head up above the parapet. I think these space industries was around, but they'd already jumped overseas, sort of given up on Australia. And then the other two, and University of New South Wales, where you are now, and the Space Net team. They all sort of put their hands up and said, let's do something and let's try and begin creating this infrastructure um, this, this sort of community. So the, the question back then was, well, why should we do space startups? And so we, no doubt you've seen a similar slide to this, surely with micro processes and everything coming down to cost uh, and mobile phones essentially having everything in a satellite, we can do uh, a satellite for a thousand times less. That's what the conference is all about. You've probably seen this slide too really about moving towards a revolution in the speed of iteration of technology, dropping the cost of that involved, going, getting faster to orbit. Uh, it, it hasn't quite played out as quickly as we want, but at the same time, I think it's accelerating. So a revolution in access to space. We also started to see predictions of a massive spike in the number of CubeSats, and certainly people like Elon want to fly thousands of satellites. Fleet, I know, wants to fly many hundreds, and there are lots and lots of other plans around the world. And we had back then this, this about $5 billion that had been dropped on, quote, new space companies, which are companies that are either, either completely brand new or spin out or trying to take an entrepreneurial, digital culture approach to space. Now, the other things that have been happening around this time is this absolute massive online revolution, disrupting every single industry in the world. So there was an argument, well, surely if all these industries are being disrupted, why not space? And here's a really powerful slide that I love showing to people. This was the convocation of Pope Benedict XVI in 20, 2005. And this was eight years later, the convocation of Pope Francis. These are the changes that have happened in society since then. Uh, we're so much more digital now. Back in 2010, you can see the bright lights are in, typically in these areas of developed economies, and then there's a lot of darker areas in the undeveloped world. Um, and here's 
numbers here are millions. So if you look at North America, about 300 million, Europe, 660 million, middle class, Asia Pac, 520, and South Saharan Africa, 32 million is middle class. Let's look at 2030. Again, look at North America, very little growth. Look at Europe, very little growth. But look at all those other places. The middle class is going to be mostly in what today we call emerging economies outside of the traditional areas that we've been used to selling products and services to. And it just so happens that the fastest growing regions up to the north of us here in Australia. There's a lot of countries out there right now uh, in, in spending money on space. There's a lot of governments out there doing stuff. And then we see a 15 year timeline of about 14% year on year growth. And it's very interesting, the UK industry target down the bottom of the screen there, I hope you can all read that, that by 2030, Brits want to have a 10% share, uh, which, which, which on the money when they started this was about 70 billion quid a year. Uh, that's what how big their industry they want it to be. They want it to be about the same proportion of the global GDP as their economy. To hold on to that little thought, one trillion by 2030. So why Australia? So we have this huge land mass and we're responsible for a huge amount of the oceans around it and the airspace. And um, also, as I said before, to the north of us, we just take ASEAN. It's 30 times bigger in population and it's only a little bit bigger in GDP right now. So in, by 2030, we expect the GDP in these markets to massively increase, whereas we're not seeing, expecting huge growth in our GDP here, where there's a huge amount of talent, there's a huge amount of opportunity, but certainly not scale. So we believe there's this opportunity to create space startups that will scale. And of course, we're talking about the applications, just some examples, smart cities, precision agriculture, the New South Wales Department of Primary Industry and others estimate there's a 30% uplift possible if we're using decision support systems and data better. Space has to be a part of that. We had a massive typhoon a few weeks ago and then we're still having difficulty getting first responder information out of that like quickly to the hands of people who need it, etc. etc. Here's a very prosaic example. Here's an example of mashing up machine learning space data, looking at the shadows side, who is hoarding oil and who is selling oil to really give you a sense of what the future commodity price is going to be. Just one little thin slice of the kind of dozens and dozens and dozens of applications. And of course, we know that space is crack for geeks and the online media world is really the dominant player now in branding and marketing. And guess what? Australia happens to win a lot of awards around the world for its media and marketing. We have not really tapped into this world at all to fund our startups to do any major adventures yet. And we need to start doing that. So, some of the things that started happening was we started having companies looking at fully vertically integrated models like Cube Rider, who I'm sure you've all heard of, and also Fleet, who started to look at an adjacent sector, IoT, and realized there were huge opportunities for space. And Fleet, you know, very, as hopefully you've been talking about, it's just gone on the front cover of the AFR, has closed a $5 million round, funded by Atlassian, Mike Cannon Brooks, and Blackbird Ventures. And Fleet was originally born out of, I think, the still existing company doing STEM launch box down there at the bottom right. So we're starting to see things happen. It's the, the wonderful suborbital project that's happening and expected to be an orbital capability from Gilmore Space Technologies. And I know the Space Ops guys here at Sydney also have similar designs and actually launching small satellites in space from Australia. So we've got a lot of changes, and, and here's just a, an example of all the different entities that have, have appeared on the scene since 2004, 14, just three years ago. So there is a lot of growth occurring, a lot of new experiments being run, there's some failures which are really just learning, and there's a set of professionals that are starting to learn what it means to pull together technology, customers, capital, and build a scalable business. So where we are, we've just done the first part of the survey. We've worked out that there are around 30 startups. In fact, we don't think we've seen all of them so far. There's around 30 startups at all sorts of different stages. There's about $10 million if we, if we discount some of the later stage companies like Pacific. There's about $10 million that have been raised across these 18. Recently, we've had Cube Rider manage to get the first payload of the ISS, which is, which is historic in December, and then, of course, this week, Fabulous three Australian integrated design built CubeSat launched to the ISS for deployment as part of the QB50 mission, and in fact a fourth satellite as part of a US Australia defence project which has some technology in it from 
innovative way to start to take a look and say maybe in 10 years uh, this thing's going to be really huge. So let's have a little look at, at what we're talking about. We're seeing that there's this value chain emerging where you've got <coughs> folks in the room sitting around you who are starting to create upstream products that are collecting data and doing things in space. We've also got some folks who are starting to use the data from those things to solve problems. And then on the ground, we've got more and more customers. And the world has some huge scale problems, which, of course, space is perfect for major scale, that need this data. So as, as the value from those the sensors in space blows down to a big scale problem, it gets more and more valuable. And, and we need those, that connection between what we're doing and the wider community to be clearer and clearer in all our minds. The reason we need that is when you turn the flow back up stream and you start saying, well, I need validation to raise money or to hire people or to get that license or to go into that new market, then these big scale problems, running tests, running experiments with little cubes apps and very small, let's say, subset groups like just the wine industry or just you know, year nine students allows you to create very powerful stories that flow right back up to you sitting at the top of that or anywhere else in that, in that value chain. And this combination, just jumping back quickly, it's a combination of how value starts flowing down as you get closer to the customer, but validation and evidence <coughs> in your business model starts flowing back up from the customer. This is something that we're teaching all the different value chains right now in my, in my day job, teaching them in the energy sector, in the agricultural sector, in the finance sector, in health, they're all seeing this disruption of value chain. So space is really no different. And new space is really, you know, we need to learn from all these other things that are going on right now. So let's just look at a roadmap to a $40 billion industry. This isn't a complete chart, so we're going to try to answer some questions and add some more detail to this. Um, but just working through it real quick, along the top, 2014 through to 2030, down the left-hand side, global industry turnover, Australian industry turnover, global new space investment and, and the, the scale of the sector, Australian new space investment and the scale of the sector. So in 2014, we saw the global industry was about 250 billion growing quite quickly. Down the bottom there, we have almost no investment, just really what we could rustle up ourselves and ourselves and, and two visible startups in Australia. And as I said, jump forward to 2017, global industry turnover has increased. And we worked out in a, in a white paper that was co-authored by the Space uh, Industry Association of Australia, Lockheed Martin, and a bunch of other folks. We worked out that we're, we're occupying about 0.8% of the global spend right now. So about 0.8% seems to be about the number. Um, and, and then other people have also been talking about, well, it's between three and four billion, we're not sure. So anyway, you do the math, it's definitely not 10 billion, um, but it's, it's, it's some kind of number down there. And almost all of that is us buying stuff from overseas. I think 99.9% of us is buying stuff from overseas. Globally, it, it seems like about 250 folks plus um, are claiming to be startups versus sort of existing space companies. Um, uh, New Space Global is tracking about a thousand different companies, but I'd say about a quarter are real New Space. Um, maybe the number's 500, so we've got to work that out. Uh, but as I said, in Australia, we've raised 10 million bucks across 28 startups. If we include people like Pacific, who founded and raised money since 2014, then we've raised 50 million bucks um, because they've managed to close a $40 million round for their, their uh, traditional KA band, Pacific Islands, and uh, and, uh, Sorry, yeah, you don't mean to uh, interrupt because I, you're, you're you're on a real roll here, uh, and I, I love the information you're putting out. But you got about one minute with questions. So, did you hear me? Yeah, I'm really close to the end. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and anyway, if we decide that we want to have an industry turnover around four percent of the global economy, then that's a forty billion dollar industry. So, really, what we've tried to do. Uh, and we're trying to do with Delta V now is to connect as many people together uh, to really have this idea that the rising tide floats all boats and to get stuff done. And, uh, and, and we're coming closer to that. So really, and it's about these guys. We want to create a 
we're pretty much out of time, but I, I reckon just because it was such an awesome talk, let's let's get two questions out of or one or two questions if you guys got them. Any questions at all? Um, so Tim, I don't know if you can hear me, but I, I heard that you were planning like a missions planning workshop at some point. Is that still going ahead? Because I was really interested in that. Yes. Um, so we're we're we want to announce it. Uh, we want to announce that shortly. Um, we're putting the finishing touches on how that's going to work, but we'd like to do a mission planning workshop in, in every major capital city. Uh, Perth is proving difficult uh, just because of transport, but we've got some venues sorted out in Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane, and shortly Adelaide. Uh, so I'm really just trying to wrap up a bit of sponsorship for that. But yeah, we're, we're looking to run that with the mission model campus, and that's one of the reasons I'm in Adelaide, is to uh, hopefully get taught on all of that and, and raise a bit of sponsorship money. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Any other questions in the back? Uh, Tim, I was wondering if you wanted to say anything about Delta V's activities at IAC 2017. So, well, beautiful, um, beautiful segue there. Um, <laughs> so, on the Wednesday of the IAC program, we, uh, we being Delta V, Airbus, Kinect, the French Space Agency, and the French Embassy are going to put together an innovation roundtable, a new space roundtable. And we've, we've got quite a few details that uh, Will and myself and all of Vignelle are working through, uh, but we also hope to announce that, and there'll be an opportunity to pitch for travel bursaries, and hopefully an opportunity for up to six teams from anywhere, really, to pitch a new innovation space alongside uh, some of our funded companies. So more information coming soon. Uh, and we, we definitely want to blow fan the flames of that and make it something great in IFC. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Tim. That was great. Thanks, guys.